Hello World Wide Web, I'm Rekha Shadow, the internet personality of the best hair, and it's time to tackle another long time request, believe it or not, Dog Soldiers. Released in 2002, but looking like something out of 1982, Dog Soldiers is a low-budget Scottish horror film written and directed by Neil Marshall. It's about a group of soldiers. They aren't dogs, but the name is a nice reference to the Cheyenne tribe militia, so there's that. Also, it's not like this movie doesn't have more than a little canine influence on the events that unfold. Suffice to say, in Dog Soldiers, a small group of military men head out for a military exercise. However, this being a horror movie, shit does not go according to plan, and before you know it, they are being hunted by ravenous monsters in the forests of Scotland. What exactly? My money's on an escaped, unshaven Sean Connery, but let's take a look at Dog Soldiers and see just how wrong I am. First things first, the movie reminds us this is Scotland before introducing us to two random campers, played by Tina Landini and Craig Conway. Their characters don't necessarily have names, but they do have items that are obviously going to be very important later. It's perfect. Yeah, and it's also solid silver, so don't lose it. After all, you never know when some hell beast will show up and you need that bane damage to get the job done. Or maybe you do, as these campers get ready for fucking. However, it would appear that it's not Jason Voorhees they're going to have to look out for in this wilderness. <laughs> But the Creeper Pumpkinhead. Yeah, they're right, keeping the monster in the shadows does make the audience think of something far scarier than they could ever show us. Also about his silver letter opener, just ignore that for now, it's not good enough to get him out of this predicament. But it's alright, he's still alive. Mainly because we teleport two days earlier before he got fucking killed. This introduces us to a new character, Private Cooper, played by Kevin McKidd. We find him running for his life, but not quite fast enough. You evaded capture for 22 hours and 47 minutes. We'll be docking your pay for that. Get your ass back to work. The grill isn't going to clean itself. He may not be a fast food employee, but he is actually in training for this special ops team, led by Captain Ryan, played by Liam Cunningham. He's quite the demanding boss, however. Yeah, shoot the dog. Oh gee, I wonder if he might be the bad guy. As Cooper is a good guy, following the direct order to kill an innocent animal isn't one of the things his character is capable of. So, bad guy Ryan shoots the dog anyway, thankfully off screen, before informing Private Cooper that he's failed his initiation into Special Forces. No bother, skipping right past the opening scene, we jump four weeks ahead to find that the team Cooper is a part of just so happened to be selected for a training exercise in these woods. Said team consisting of the leader, Sergeant H.G. Wells, played by Sean Pertwee, Corporal Bruce Campbell, played by Thomas Lockyer, Spoonie, played by Darren Morfitt. Yeah, just a second, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that that would be a reference to the Spoonie one, but you know, all things considered... Well, the team is rounded out with Privates Joe Kirkley and Terry Milburn, played by Chris Robson and Leslie Simpson, respectively. The team has been brought out here, armed with blanks, to perform combat exercises against a Special Forces team. They also spent enough time bickering back and forth that we get a good feel for the characters and their individual motivations. I can't believe I'm missing the footy for this party. So if you don't shut up, I swear to God, I'm a fucking slot you myself. Now move. Didn't say a word, sir. Honestly, I really like the character interactions in this movie. It's crude and aggressive, but believable. It feels a lot less like the group from Sabotage and a lot more like the guys from Predator. Bloody brilliant, mate. Either way, noting a gap in the enemy's defensive line, the group heads forth to sneak through the riverbed under the cover of night. It's a long walk past cows with itchy butts, so they have plenty of time for more chats, both to let us get to know the character quirks a bit better, and to remind us that a couple of unsuspecting campers were killed in these very woods just one month ago. Not only that, they aren't the only ones. Lots of people just vanish after coming this way. I'm never seen again. <laughs> Which I obviously don't believe. I really can't blame him on that one. This campfire story has been done to death. A first hint that things may not be as they seem is the fact that the special forces they are going against happen to be led by special forces bad guy himself, Captain Ryan. That and he is tracking their progress, but not engaging them, suggesting that this isn't the exercise they were led to believe. No matter, another night, another campfire, and another batch of campfire stories await. This time the team goes around the circle asking each of them what it is that scares them the most. Spiders. And women. And, uh, spider women. <laughs> really? I always kind of had a thing for driders. 
You can count on H.G. Wells to come up with a story to terrify his men, though. Recalling his years of military service, he brings up a friend of his from way back when. Eddie, a true believer, he somehow figured his soul was fine, but his body was damned, so what the hell? Get a tattoo of the devil on his ass to keep that in one piece. Despite this lucky charm, one anti-tank mine later, and Wells had to spend some time scooping up stray pieces of his friend. Hardly recognizable, spare for one lone butt cheek in pristine condition with a devil tattoo on it. So you could say that Eddie was right. That Satan did indeed save his skin, just not all of it. Well, goddamn, how in the hell are you supposed to follow a story like that? Bartender's looking at him thinking, what the fuck is going on here? Then he looks back at the dog, and to his surprise, the dog turns around and says, <laughs> Fucking cow! A jump scare, really. You know, this is exactly why every single attempt to make a new Twilight Zone series always falls flat. As expected, this startles the hell out of the guys, but once they realize it's just a dead cow, they aren't scared at all. I mean, sure, it's got horrible wounds from bites and or claws, but that could mean anything. Come morning, they figure the cow dropped down a convenient cliff near their campsite, and don't pay it all that much mind past that. However, the trail to the riverbed has its own spooky surprises, like random pools of blood, piles of guts, and let's not forget the Special Forces equipment laying everywhere, but the Special Forces themselves nowhere to be found. All right, Corporal. Get on the net and call in on emergency airlift immediately. I want it. Even worse, the lone survivor is Captain Douchebag. Though Survivor may be pushing it, as the man has some massive wounds on his chest, and is suffering from serious blood loss. Sucks to be him, as it seems not only was the Special Forces radio ripped to shreds, but our group of grunts can't get their equipment to work. Seems not only is it fried, but it's definitely been fucked with. I also found this. It's attached inside, not part of the radio. Looks like a transmitter. Why would they put a bug in our radio? Well, fuck, if it's anything like how my Facebook is scoured for information is to serve you ads and sell you shit. Unfortunately, though, the sun's going to be setting very soon. And what's worse, they're not alone. Bruce, Bruce, maybe try racking the slide after putting the magazine in. As Mr. Campbell can't figure out how firearms work, he runs for his life. As expected, this doesn't work either. Uh, okay, did the creatures do that, or did he just run into the tree like an idiot? I mean, with the editing, it's a little hard to tell. One thing we can say for certain, the beasts tear into Sergeant Wells, leaving his insides on the outside. Not quite killing him, though, as Cooper swoops in to save him. As dusk sets in, it does make things look pretty bad for our team, as they are relentlessly hunted by the mysterious monsters. But what's this? A car is spotted on the road. Damn you, anti-lock brakes! Always doing what you can to prevent the body count from rising. Well, that and the fact that the driver, Megan, played by Emma Cleesby, has just swooped in to save them. Considering this is a horror movie, even though the car doesn't stall, it still won't move, giving the creatures plenty of time to terrify the passengers before they manage to slip away. I heard gunfire last night. I knew someone was out there. If you weren't already in trouble, then you soon would be. We are. The radio's out. Bruce didn't even fucking know how to use guns, and no one remembered to pack the marshmallows. He's more interested in helping the wounded, actually, so Megan mentions this place as a whole one option for shelter. A farm. It's cool, though. She knows the folks who own the place. However, when they arrive, it looks abandoned. Unless you count Sam here, played by Vilriki's Acer, in their only role. No bother, it just means you don't have to ask permission. Wait, you can't just help yourself. I'm chin strapped and I'm bloody starving. <laughs> can't help myself. It's a training, miss. Never waste an opportunity to eat. You should feel lucky. I got more than a little awkward during our tour of Candyland. Slight problem, though. There's no phone. According to Megan, the closest line is a whopping 50 miles away. Which means this forest is larger and less populated than any forest in Scotland, but that's not the point. They're not going anywhere anyway, because the monsters just so happen to tear Megan's Jeep to pieces. And then Cooper blows it up. That was my car! Yes, the operative word there is was. He caused the explosion in an attempt to drive the beasts off, but they're still kicking. This calls for a handy-dandy deadbolt. Okay, problem solved. Now they have enough time to introduce themselves and get the motivations out of the way. You came here because of them, right? I don't have a fucking clue what they are, and right now I don't really care. Well, what are you doing here? Well, to be honest with you, I went for a walk trying to hatch some Pokemon eggs, and 
I guess I got a little carried away. Hearing they're not part of an elite squad sent to take out the creatures, but instead a collection of grunts caught here after an unrelated routine exercise, she decides the least she can do is fill them in on exactly what the hell they're up against. So what are we talking about here, wolves? Not entirely wolf, nor all human, but something in between. Oh dear God, they're surrounded by murderous furries! Or werewolves. Doesn't exactly rule my theory out anyway. Of course, Cooper doesn't believe her, despite what he's seen already. It's not too important. The first thing he's got to do is give emergency medical attention to Sergeant Wells, holding his abdomen together with good old-fashioned super glue. This stuff was developed for the Vietnam War to patch up broken soldiers. Well, maybe that doesn't mean there has to be a movie out there where in the last-ditch effort, in the nick of time, they save the day with Silly Buddy. Though there probably should be. That would be awesome. No matter the case, this is going to require a little more than some whiskey Anastasia. Knock me out! Hit me! Oh, you fucking pussy! Hit me! Lucky bastard, not only do they not knock me out for my dental work, but they tell me I can't even have alcohol for a while afterwards. After they're done making sure the sergeant has the guts to survive, Megan goes over her role in this Scottish werewolf in Scotland tale. While Cooper fills a magazine with rounds that have already had their primer struck, uh, well, it looks like the body count ain't done yet. But either way, Megan is a wildlife photographer who came here after reports of strange creatures kept popping up. Believing it to be some rare beast, she was more than a little surprised herself to find out they were motherfucking werewolves! The eyebrows thing is nonsense. It's just Dark Age paranoia. And silver bullets, no one's ever got close enough to try. How close do you have to be? They're projectile weapons. They project? Cooper still doesn't buy it, but that's not the important thing. He's got to introduce her to all his team, plus one more. Ryan over here, who is special forces and now quite chipper for a man who lost so much blood not all that long ago. Trying to find out why results in a scuffle, but that's nothing some spare bindings can't solve. But wouldn't you know it? What now? To shut down the generator! Why would they do that? Because they can see in the dark. And you're afraid of it. Uh, no, the not being able to see shit part is enough of a disadvantage on its own. As we could expect, this leads to an attack. The power being out means we conveniently can't see the werewolves all that well, allowing the soldiers to look totally badass as they battle back the malevolent monstrosities. Fuck! So much for class balance. We're gonna let the werewolves use shotguns. Why not give them motorcycles and leather jackets on top of it? No one could defeat something so badass. Fortunately for the soldiers, the shotgun wielding is a one-and-done deal with the werewolves. They seem to be a more traditional pack, foregoing things like clothing or pressing forward against the barrage of lead bullets that are clearly not killing them. Instead, after taking a fire, they turn tail and leave. Dogs. More like pussies. And the body count rises. It's about damn time. Last person to die was Bruce, and that was like a half hour ago. But now Terry is fucking dead, and Megan accidentally cuts her hand on the perfectly clean glass. Oh, well, I'm sure this is actually a horrible thing we should all worry about later. Right now they have to figure out what to do. Considering they have a total of zero travel options, it doesn't take long to come up with the idea to hold out for six or so hours until sunrise, Evil Dead style. You can't have constant werewolf attacks though, so this gives Megan even more time to talk about the concept of the plot with the other characters. Those things out there are real. If they're real, what else is real? Alright, alright, I'll review Leprechaun! Jesus Christ! But the real dark revelation is the surprise that Megan also knows Captain Ryan. As it turns out, his team came down and questioned her about the mysterious creatures that allegedly inhabit these woods. They came to check out the stories. They needed an expert. It's just a few more hours, Cooper. That's all it is. All clear? And that particular plot point is never brought up again! The hell were they trying to do? Make Ryan the boogeyman of every character? What are we gonna learn next? He gave Spoonie swirlies in high school? Which would be nicer than what's going on for him today. Seems Megan neglected to mention that there just so happens to be a Land Rover in the shed. But she doesn't have the keys, so if Spoon could be a doll, or more specifically the bait to draw the werewolves away, Joe can quickly slip into the shed and hotwire the car, leaving the lycanthropes lackadaisical to his location. If you want all the werewolf perks, you gotta eat a few motherfuckers. 
No reason to wait around, Joe's in a freshly hot-wired car, so he drives it away to save everyone! Except one slight problem. You're behind me, aren't you? Either that or fucking Xenomorph decided to hitch a ride. The end result is the same, Sloppy Joe. That results in a short little shootout, and wouldn't you know it, while the car still runs, the busted fuel line means they won't make it nearly far enough before becoming a boxed lunch. Oh, well, I guess there's not much else to do right now but get more exposition out of the way. Remember that operation Ryan was doing out here? Well, it turns out he knew about the werewolves all along. Or at least there being one. The pack thing kind of fucked up his plans. The point is, they never came out to destroy them, but capture and retrieve one to be used for military purposes. How exactly did Wells' unit fit into this plan? I made a gap in enemy lines. You were good enough to spot it and predictable enough to go for it. That was your bait. You were mine. They were camo bedeck kibbles and bits from the get-go. Crew expendable and all that jazz. To make matters worse, remember that werewolf attack that Ryan survived? Good! Remember what happens to those who are bitten and or scratched by werewolves but live? Yeah, Ryan's a werewolf now. He might slip away, but don't worry. They wound him just enough to ensure he'll be easily identifiable during the final confrontation. Also, around this time, the characters finally realize the happy, friendly farmer family that lives here probably happens to be the werewolf pack that's been tormenting them all this time, so they aren't likely to back away anytime soon. The bad news just keeps coming as Wells reveals that his disembowelment is feeling much better because he is in fact turning just like Ryan. With their backs to the wall, it's decided that they should take the fight to the pack, sabotaging the busted Land Rover and taking out what surely is the werewolf lair, the nearby shed. Which runs into a few snags, but overall goes pretty well. You know what that means. This stunt didn't help at all because dun dun dun, Megan was working with the werewolves the entire time! She did come as a nature photographer and actually was still human and being held captive by the were family, but all that's changed now that that tiny piece of glass cut her hand, and now there's no way she's going to escape the curse. So, gotta kill everyone now, I guess. They were always here. I just unlocked the door. It's that time of the month. Really? I thought this movie was bloody enough. Thus, she transforms into Were-Bitch, and is promptly killed. Now, with the werewolves crawling all over the interior, Spoon, Wells, and Cooper must fight to survive. I think it's dark, and the action and cuts are a little on the confusing side. It is a confusing situation, so that makes sense, but it does make it a little easy to lose track of exactly who is left and in what condition. The Spoon! There is no Spoon. Yeah, that was a Matrix reference. What a horrible way to die. With most all the werewolves surrounding them and Wells quickly starting to turn, he makes the command decision to let Cooper escape into the basement while he himself utilizes a combination of gas lines and the spirit of Michael Bay to blow the whole fucking house to kingdom come! This leaves Cooper as the sole survivor. Sort of. Ryan, you tried licking your own balls yet? <laughs> Jeez, wolf man, how many fleas you got crawling up your ass? Oh yeah, but remember that little tiny thingamabobber they established in the first scene and mentioned was solid silver? Well, it just so happens to be right there, and Cooper stabs it into Ware Ryan, killing the beast with the power of the prop department. Therefore, happy ending! Cooper has survived, everyone else is fucking dead, and the place is a smoldering wasteland. But don't worry, he's got his new friend Dogmeat to keep him company, so everything is going to be okay. Assuming Scotland transforms back into Scotland and he doesn't have to walk for 12 weeks to get anywhere out of there with no food and water or anything on the way. But anyway, that was Dog Soldiers, and it's a pretty basic low-budget horror affair. And it's fantastic! Considering the year it came out in, I'm not sure if the film grain was an intentional nod to the 80s look, or if it was simply what the production could afford that would give them the aesthetic they were going for. Whatever the case, Dog Soldiers does feel in many ways like an 80s horror film that was somehow made in the early 2000s. Like I said, the concept is simple. It's pretty much an old dark house film with werewolves. Not the most out there creative monster you can think of. These aren't even special werewolves with skill modifiers or hot young guy modes. Just the classic wolfmen who fucking kill people during the full moon. Yet somehow the movie comes together brilliantly. 
I attribute that mainly to the cast of characters and the actors portraying them. Each is unique enough that even though I admittedly had a little trouble with the accent at times, I was still engaged by their banter. We're given enough time to get to really know each member of the team, and their jabs at each other really feel like camaraderie instead of hostility. It's said that at one point Jason Statham was lined up to play a lead role, but for one reason or another, couldn't make it. Much as I honestly enjoy the man's work, I say good, as Statham's presence would have likely thrown all of that way off balance. Unfortunately, with such a basic plot, though, a lot of the twists are pretty easy to figure out much earlier than they are revealed to the viewer. Despite this, the whole of the movie is plenty entertaining, coming in at a solid four obviously useless rounds of ammunition out of five. And thank you all for suggesting I review it, because the DVD case for this movie really doesn't do it justice. Thank you all for watching, I've been Dr. Shadow, and remember, if a stray werewolf follows you home, don't feed it your little brother, it'll never leave. Oh, you fucking pussy, Eddie! <laughs>